And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a newcomer to the temple. <coughs> well, some semi-newcomer if I want to be extremely pedantic. Coming to us straight from Divine Madness Press, the creator of the fight the RP the fighting game RPG better known as Fight with an exclamation point. The one and only D Christopher Peter, not to be confused with Robin. How are you doing today, man? I'm doing all right. How are you doing? I am doing good. <clears throat> it it is it is a little bit too bright and sunny for my taste, but I'll manage. Not around here, it's not. <laughs> you want to you want to switch weathers? <laughs> uh, yes, actually, I do. <laughs> I'm just I'm just counting the days until winter comes back. I know there, I know uh -oh. there's the old meme about winter is coming, but um, that's <laughs> but given where I come from, one that's half the year, and two that's where I'm going to be at my most comfortable because out oh, because I know how to dress in layers, and every every one of my colleagues doesn't. Fair enough. Fair enough. So, a bit of a tradition is to open with the humble beginnings, in a sense. So, I'd like you to walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games, and what about it made it stick? Okay, sure. All right, humble beginnings, huh? All right, so humble beginnings for me goes back to uh, 1978. So, I am one of the, uh, the first-generation role-players... Um, and, uh, I started when I was, uh, when I was eight years old and I actually did not start with role-playing exactly. My, uh, my first exposure to role-playing games was through, uh, Metagaming's, uh, the fantasy trip, which Metagaming eventually became Steve Jackson games and, uh, their games Melee and Wizard, which eventually became the fantasy trip, um, uh, which was uh, dudes on a board, but uh, but it was also a role playing game, and uh, that was the first exposure I had to the idea of making a character, and that character being you know mind that had had a, a name and a personality besides just being you know stats and weapons. Um, so that was actually where I, I first started in role playing, and it was kind of cool to see the fantasy trip come back via Kickstarter uh, last year, the year before. I am. Um, I guess I'll have to admit the nostalgia wasn't so great that I bought into it because I, I I knew as much as I'd enjoy reading them that I it wasn't going to get played so I, I I didn't bother but um, I did pick up Dungeons and Dragons a short time after that and uh, and found it honestly at the time very different from the fantasy trip because combat was actually so much simpler uh, so much less tactical that it was uh, like oh well I guess this is this is different but. Um, but ultimately, it did take hold, and so now I have uh, I've played a campaign, at least one campaign, of every edition of D and D since then, from from original through through fifth, and a lot of uh, OSR stuff along the way. Um, and then in the early '80s, I found Champions in the Hero System, which became a lifelong friend for decades. My last major Champions game uh, finished in 2004, and I picked it up again since then, but it, not not for quite as long a time. But but man, superhero role playing that really that really became my thing and remains my thing. I mean, I play I've played every genre I think, and I like some genres a lot. Uh, but superhero games are always where I go back to. It's what my current uh, live group is uh, is playing right now as well. And, um, so yeah, so that's, that's, that's a big deal for me there. The other genre I, I try to play a lot, but rarely succeed to is I like espionage games as well. And uh, I've kept trying to write an espionage game and haven't succeeded yet. Uh, I think they're very difficult to write. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, that, that, that should be enough to get us started anyway. Yeah. Now it's an, it's, um. It's interesting that you met. It's interesting that you mentioned a fond a fondness for soup for superhero games, um, and in and in the in that one of the things I'd like to ask that I've I've asked a few other people when it comes to when it comes to the concept of supers. In fact, I did a whole panel on that a few weeks ago. Um, is what 
what do you think the appeal is when it comes to that particular style of play? Okay, I think I think it's a, a few things. I, I think the most blunt and obvious one is is the same reason people like superheroes in general. It's just the idea of wish fulfillment. I mean, I think that kind of goes without saying. And of course, role playing games are even better for that because we we don't have to just talk about wish fulfillment. We can actually play it out in a structured setting, and that's that's really great. Um, for me personally. Uh, another thing that I really appreciate about superhero games is I really like the idea of um, of, of of heroes of uh, you know of, of you know virtuous good guys and and morally upstanding good guys. I mean, I, I'm the type who plays the paladin in D and D. Um, so having the um, even when you do a messy superhero story, there's a presumption that there's a that there's there are good guys and bad guys, and uh, and I like the 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 clarity and the cleanness of that as a, as a storytelling arc. And then um, I think the other thing that I would say is a, a big deal with superhero games is uh, they are the ultimate kitchen sink games. So, so I mean, pretty much any idea that you're going to come up with is going to fit in there somehow. Maybe some tweaking is going to be necessary, but, but I mean, I've seen uh, superhero games where the players are all D&D &D players, so one of them inevitably makes some sort of a wizard or some other guy makes a time-displaced warrior, and, y and you can still just make it happen. So um, I like the fact that I don't have to feel um, uh, like I'm only going to be telling a certain kind of story. I, got, I can do a lot of stuff with superheroes. Now, now, um, when it come, you also mentioned wanting to wanting to do wanting to do something spy fiction related, and um, obvi obviously, the, obviously, the appeal with some, with something like that is 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 fairly obvious. I, th I think, um, I think Racevic said it be said it best when he said when he described spy fiction as, um, being being some place you shouldn't, meeting some place, meeting someone you shouldn't know. Doing some, doing something that you should that you shouldn't do. Um, yeah, that all sounds good. <laughs> what? Um, but it's but you had meant you had mentioned that you've had, that there's been some difficulty with doing that. Is it more of difficulty in getting a getting a group to buy into it, or or diffi or difficulty in the um, in the game in whatever game you're picking to use it? Uh, it's definitely not the first. My my players have no problem buying into it. There were were most of us are fans of the genre. Um, mechanically, man, that's that's where I find it really difficult to do and do well. I, I, on the one sense, you could say it's really easy. Like you have any any modern you know rule set in theory, you can do espionage. But but I think the genre has enough important tropes to it that and this is a big part of my own game design i like designing two genre tropes uh and so i don't think that there's many games that do that well um i i guess there's a couple i think that do it pretty well uh i i do think spycraft second edition did it well but man if there was ever an, a, an example of rules bloat it was it was that game and um i've i've tried to play it rules as written and it was um it was it was too much, um, but it's still very cool. And I would say the other one that I think does it especially well is Knights Black Agents by uh, Pelgrain Press. Uh, but that uses the gumshoe system, a heavily modified gumshoe system, which is definitely not to every player's taste. Yeah the the gumshoe system was 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 built for investigative style play, and it does it does that very well. Um, the the trick the tricky thing is um when it comes to the, when it comes to the spy when it comes to the spy genre is that it's a genre that's on a spectrum, um, I like to, I like to consider it a, a a a bit of a one plane alignment where on one end you have the you have um you have the Tom Clancy you've got your you've got your Jason Bournes you've got your Jack Reachers, um that sort of hyper realism um approach. And on the other hand, you have the more you have the more comp, you have the more um, pulpy kind of approaches. Um, you're James Bond. You're the Man from Uncle. Um, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And I think I might uh, uh, spread your spectrum out a little bit further than that. I would I would go even further out out to uh, past the hyper real to something like Macare, you know, which gets us closer to real spy work, which I personally find pretty dull for gaming. Yeah, I'm 
I'm just go. I'm just going that when when it comes to trying to do a spy, when it comes to trying to do um sp spy fiction that most people would be somewhat fam somewhat familiar with, even with memetically, that that cover that covers a good enough net. I can go further sure. if I want to get really pedantic, but that's a case of getting lost in the woods. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, now, when it com now when it comes to when it comes when it com this brings me to um to fight because the vibe that the vibe that I've gotten from you is that you're so is that you're someone who is willing to jump around between systems instead of being a single or even two or even two or three system um, lifer. Um, Absolutely. So, how how did you how did you get into fighting games and how, and I'd like you to go through the moment where the idea of the two of them inter of fighting games and role playing games intersecting first propped up in your mind. Okay. Um, so before I even got to fighting games, I would have to say it started with martial arts movies, and uh, and watching a lot of the, a lot of the bad martial arts movies of the eighties. I mean, as I, as I you know going back to my humble beginnings again, I remind you I'm old. And uh, so so the, we did do some gaming that that was ordered towards those kinds of movies, like you know your Steven Seagal and Jean Claude Van Damme movies. And uh, for that, we often used uh, the Hero System, which at the time it was called Ninja Hero. And now, now it would just be you know martial arts hero system, um, and and I always like that sort of stuff. I've always appreciated the uh, the 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 both the athleticism and the the wire foo that that comes up in those kinds of movies. Um, so when I got a hold of fighting games, which for me definitely started with Street Fighter Two. I was I was automatically drawn to this because it was it was martial arts fighting, which I thought was really cool. But then all the different characters had different visual styles to them and visual fighting styles um, that differed as well. So I wanted to I wanted to try everything. Um, so from there, uh, I was around that time. It was a year or two later. It was about a year later from starting Street Fighter Two that um, that that the Street Fighter role playing game came out, the Storyteller System one. And I thought, this is great. Here's a system that is focused, that was intended to do uh, Street Fighter. Um, even though, you know, since since then, I look back at some of the stuff that was written in that book, and I go like, oh, this is this is just wretchedly bad compared to what it's supposed to be, but uh, in terms of fluff and stuff. But um, but I, I was really excited by this, and so our group got to, got to playing this right away. It was an easy groove for us because we had already been playing Vampire and Werewolf, so the system was already familiar. And, uh, and one of our guys, who was not the normal game master for the group, that would be me, uh, but one of the other guys decided he was going to run this, and he managed to run, uh, I, I moved away, I wasn't part of this campaign, but he managed to run a campaign for five years using the, the Street Fighter system. Uh, so it definitely had legs to it. But back in the world of fighting games, my enthusiasm for playing Street Fighter led me to hunt down and discover all sorts of other fighting games. Um, and... Uh, you know, using um, uh, the Sega Saturn and uh, and a chipped PlayStation, I was able to to get uh, a lot of stuff out. And then, if I jump ahead a few years to 1999, we get the Dreamcast, which was which was the best 2D fighting system, pretty much best fighting game system uh, I think that's ever been released, uh, hardware wise. And um, so I was getting inundated with all of these new characters and these new stories as well, especially the stories of King of uh, Fighters really drew my attention. And I wanted to bring a lot of those ideas to role-playing. And so I went to the Street Fighter role-playing game and quickly found, like, there's a lot of restrictions here, a lot of limitations, too much, too much focus on real-world martial arts and a, and a system that's not really well-suited for these kinds of stories. Uh, so that's when I started looking for something else, which ultimately ended in me designing something else instead. Yeah. Now, give, now um, given, given, what you, given, the, given the design goals that you, ha that you had, and I think I'd... Um, I'd imagine that one, I'd imagine that one of the things you want wanted to do from the outset was to streamline the process, since f since um the Street Fighter storytelling game was obviously still using the trappings, even though heavily modified, of the storyteller system. Um, yes. And give <laughs> would it um in the early in the early drafts of it, what did it? Did the did the structure of fight more res, more resemble some of the trappings of um, 
of a more typical role-playing game in terms of the attribute skill dynamic? Uh, yes. <laughs> I was laughing a moment ago because you are right in saying that I, I wanted to streamline things, and certainly in the initial days of fight, I think I failed miserably at that. Um, because I, I started to realize I had um, not necessarily competing design principles, but I, I had to figure out which design principles I wanted to, to focus on. And uh, once I made the decision that I wanted to focus on emulating fighting game combat, which I know some people don't uh, like as much about fight, but which is definitely what I, I designed for, then I had to step further away from, from the source, step further away from um, Street Fighter role-playing game, but also I eventually realized I needed to step away from a lot of traditional role-playing combat uh, principles uh, and to do something different. Um, so, but the initial structure, to get back to your question, the initial structure was still fairly traditional uh, in the sense that there were no classes or anything like that. I knew I didn't want to do anything like that, but I had, I had five characteristics instead of three, and those five characteristics were on a one to eight scale, and um, I... And that was because I was trying to make a traditional RPG. And it was only a much, much later in development, uh, like, like 10 years later in development, that I realized that this was not the, uh, the way to go. And I, I changed things to what is now, now the game that's out there. Um, but yeah, it definitely did start with the, the skill list was longer. Not much longer, but it was a little bit longer. Um, Though the, the skill system, which is very simple in fight, is pretty much the same as it's always been. There was no real need to change that. But yeah, it definitely started in a more traditional place and then got more and more distinctive as time went on. And like I said, uh, definitely not more streamlined until much later. Mm -hmm. Now, with, within, that, within that setup, I'd, I'd, say, it, I'd say it's, a, um, it's, certainly, it's certainly a leap. To go to go from em, to go from emulating one particular style of fighting game, in this case Street Fighter, to go to going with a blueprint that could be used for en, for any um, fighting game like equivalent. Um, yeah, that was what, tough. <laughs> so, and it, given given that, what were some of the what were some of the things that um, that in that in that transition from speci from specific to broad? that you that you had learned what um wouldn't be able to be carried over it wouldn't be able to be carried over okay um well the good thing for me when i started developing it and i, I 1996 was when when fight started getting developed but it wasn't until 2006 that that the version that people have access to now was really designed i i had a, I had a 10 year design space of uh, of ultimately what i would say was a much different much more complicated game than than the one that that ultimately was developed um but when i started um 2d fighting games were not only the norm but the kind of the whole point of fight, fighting games mid 90s was to copy street fighter 2 so uh well well they had different elements to them that I, I wanted to design for different ways of doing super moves or things like that it wasn't I, I wasn't straying too far from from the base um what started to make things more complicated was first of all the advent with Virtua Fighter and Tekken of 3D fighting games and a much different way of doing combat uh, which I do think fight manages to do though I admit that its roots are definitely 2D fighting based um, and then, as you get a little later into the 90s, uh, you started to see the first um, arena-based uh, combat games. Um, um, the, the best one to me would be uh, Power Stone for that, but um, there was, what, Bio Freaks and um, War Gods, some other wretchedly bad ones. Uh, um, yes, War uh, yes, War Gods, the, ti the time when Midway tried to rip off themselves. Right, exactly. exactly. In, in which they had some pretty decent designs, but man, that was a terrible game, though. Um, so um, I started designing for that as well, and I realized that that was really... Uh, yeah, I, I put some things like, uh, in round two, I think they're still there. I think they're still there? Gosh, I don't even remember now. But of uh, having things like pickups and, and, and the like, and... Um, but, I mean, that's not where the heart of the game is. The, the heart of the game is, is definitely in a more traditional vein. But um, I have been working very 
slowly, very, very slowly at the one genre of fighting games that is not at all represented uh, in fight right now, and that I know there are plenty of fight uh, fans who want to see this happen as they they want to see a version of some version of Smash Brothers, and uh, so I've been I've been pondering it, but it's a ways off yet. Yeah, especially especially since um, I've I figured that, I figured that would be that would be a ways off since it since the way it works is very is very counter to the way fight works specifically the fact yes. that it's not about. It's not about it's not about whittling down life, although there are HP matches within Smash. But the but the crux of it is doing enough damage where you can sit where you can send someone flying off off the uh, sc off the screen or or out into the pit. Right. So it'll have to require a, a much different way of doing stuff. But uh, I'm up for the challenge. It's just it's it's lower on the list of things to be done. Yeah. Now. One of the one of the key things that I that I that I had co I of course noticed is is go is going with instead of going with a single a single all reads all the roads lead to Rome kind of die, you go with um a polyhedral approach, where yes. the uh, where the co the core at the core attributes are um are represent are represented by di by die specifically, um. And the main the main game that a lot of people will th a lot of people will think of when they see that kind of polyhedral like approach is the likes of of say Savage Worlds. Um, sure. Maybe if they're in the weeds like me, they'll think they'll think of Cortex, but that but I'm in the minority on that front. Um, <laughs> this was also well before Cortex as well. Um, what gave what gave you the idea to you to use that particular setup instead of a instead of a more typical die pool or um, or a sing or a single polyhedral. Okay, the the version that never was published did use a uh, single D10. So it was a, an entirely D10 based system, and of course, I was designing in the '90s when a string based system was was definitely that's what you did. Um, and um, the but the switch over was was something. There's, there was definitely reasons why I wanted to switch over, uh, and I did consider all sorts of different ways of doing things. But um, and I, like I said, I was before Cortex and and doing this. But I was not before Savage Worlds. But I, I will at least say in my own defense that I had not yet read Savage Worlds. And when I when I had read it, I was like oh, this is familiar. But um, the reason why to get back to the point. Uh, I wanted to be able to have something that allowed for a more dynamic play than simply bonuses to a die we're going to give for different effects. Um, so instead of saying that, that a, a situational effect would give you a plus two on initiative, changing it to increasing the initiative die still created the possibility that even though you had improved opportunities, you could still roll a one. And, uh, and that's, that is now baked very much into the way the style of the game is, is supposed to be played. And let me give you a specific example of that. Um, something that people often experience, and, and I will admit this is, this is a um, first-timer's negative play experience. I'm, I'm quite familiar with play, what people are likely to say after their first playthrough. But one of the things that is, that is crucial to fighting video games that's in fight is the notion of hit stun. And that if you get hit before you act, then your opportunities to act are either diminished or at low levels removed entirely. And so I, I will occasionally hear, is it possible then that I might never get to go during a fight? And, you know, on paper, theoretically, it's possible that that's the case. Just like it's possible that you might sit down to play Street Fighter and your opponent may may get a perfect on you and you didn't do anything at all. Um now, people will say, well, the difference here is that in Street Fighter, I'm playing for 15 seconds. In Fight, I'm playing for at least 15 minutes, probably a lot longer than that half hour to do this same fight scene. Um, but here's the thing. This gets back to the dice size. It is extraordinarily unlikely that a person is going to really be able to succeed in never allowing their opponent to go because sooner or later just the law of averages is going to make that initiative die come up a one or that con control die to come up a one when you really needed a four and 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 things change that way and you can modify the dice so that you can increase the opportunities of that happening unlike a straight bonus system 
which could have aggravated the problem much further. If the, if the, everybody had a D6 for initiative, but fast characters had a plus three on that roll, then you would have seen much worse situations than, uh, than the die size increase method works. Yeah. Now, with, now the other, th the other thing that i that I found kind of interesting that you, that, um, that you did regarding regarding the basic qualities is the split is the dividing of speed into initiative and control yes how did how did the, that's um that's a approach that i don't that i don't see all that often and i'm curious how that particular concept came about Cool. Uh, I'll tell you, it's one of my favorite things. It's like one of the parts I'm very proud of uh, because I do think it adds something. Uh, and I, I'm even going to go one step further than that and say, I think some version of it could be profitably used in other combat systems that are not based on fighting video games. I, I think that there's, there's potential there, but you know, enough tooting of my own horn on that. Um, it, the initial system was not that. The initial system was just an initiative system. It was uh, it was a, a tick based system that you tried to generate as high of an initiative total as possible, and then as you did actions, the initiative total uh, ticked down, and then once it dropped below somebody else's initiative, they 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 got to go. Um, that was the original version. And, uh, and if you were doing a bigger move, then that took more off the initiative, and and so on. Um, but then when I was playing, and uh, when, I, when I had the, the magic moment uh, in 2006 of playing uh, Maximum Impact 2, and, 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 and this is, I, I started thinking while I was fighting, and by the time I was done that session of, of beating up whoever I was with Terry Bogard, uh, that I, um, I, I went and I started drafting some new ideas. And one of them was that there was a difference between how fast a character acted and what that character was capable of doing. Um, and that the, what a character is capable of doing was a combination of what options did this character have, um, like not only, for example, is Zangai slow in general, but to really get his special moves off requires a, a lot of effort to get his good moves off, versus also player experience that, um, that you know, whether, uh, you know, you're using a fast character or a slow character, if you can, if you can spam certain moves over and over again, that makes a difference. Well, that's not just initiative. That's that's also about the ability to use the initiative. So I came up with the idea that it's not about just who goes first, but when you do have a chance to act, what are the different options that you have for to, to act? And since characters in fight, even at the outset, have at least a handful, I mean, if you talk some of the basic options, even a starting character in fight has about a half a dozen things they can do on any given turn, and a high-level character might have literally 20 or 30 different things they could do on their turn. Um, using the control die allowed you to, um, first of all, deal with the analysis paralysis by cutting out some options, but also to give you something to strive for, to say, this is what I need to do in this situation, so I need to work to get the control to do that, rather than one of my persistent problems with superhero games when comparing them to their source material, rather than just saying, why am I not going to use my 14 die energy blast every single time, no matter what? Um, th there are some supers games that I think that, that try to take care of that. The one I'm playing now, I, I think, does a pretty good job of that, but I, I definitely have seen it reduced to well you have to play the genre and it's the game master's decision to enforce the genre I'm like no I, I i shouldn't have to do that uh i for even the players who are not genre savvy there should be a way for this to feel like it's supposed to feel and i think control does that um now give now given that given that this this does bring me to um to one to one of the big issues of analysis paralysis that that can happen and i'm and because of that i'm curious if if this has been brought this has been brought up in, t in testing over the years um regarding mo regarding move creation yeah Cause I, most, I, most definitely yeah go ahead i real i realize that when you're put when you're trying to cr when you're trying to create a system in order to give people their their own ro their own roster of spe of special of special and super moves and the and the tiers beyond beyond that, but I'm not getting pedantic. Um, some de some degree of choice paralysis is inevitable, but what steps did you make to take to um, mitigate that issue? 
Um, that's a good question. Um, cause I, I think some would say that I, I don't know if I have successfully mitigated the issue, but, um, it's an effects driven system. So, and, and so any effects driven system is going to run into this as a, as a potential difficulty. I think a slight difference with fight compared to a superhero system, which I, I definitely think that there are, there's a common, common, uh, uh blood uh, between the two genres. Um, is for a superhero game, even if it's effects-driven, you have the sense of, I've read comic books, I've seen Marvel movies, so I, I know, like, I want to shoot an energy blast, I want to fly. Whereas, if you are less versed in fighting games, then looking at the list of effects, the elements and liabilities, um, seems a little more arcane. And, uh, and, and I unfortunately know that there are some people who really, really want to play fight and, and fall into that, that, the, the morass of, of move creation or the perceived morass of move creation and, and stop there. So, you know, what have I done about this? I think the most important thing I did in second edition over first, first edition, though second edition has even more options than first, uh, was to create, a, I don't have my book with me, but to, uh, there's a, a text uh, box in the early on in the chapter that explains that you do not need to be overwhelmed by the, the hundred odd choices for, for elements, that there really is a list of about 10 or 15 elements that if you just used those alone, you could make an overwhelming number of moves seen in, in fighting games. Um, that the great majority of the chapter is to is for those who are uh, trying to get that that move just right, or they have a simple move but they want to tweak it just a little bit. Or one of my favorites, those people who are toolbox players who really want to say like, I want to create something, uh, you know, that's that's just this beautiful mechanical piece like because it, it's taking pieces of the rules and putting them together um my co-writer leo is is far better at that than i when i when i'm writing npcs for my games it's like um let's see here increased damage uh hard to evade good let's move on to the next move you know um and that works it, it but it's really comes down to what, what you want to do with the system anyway um so that was my my i think my biggest mitigation is to say you don't have to go full force into all of the options but that is not the that's still not going to be enough for some people so um so you know to to do a, a little shameless plugging here um we're we're probably only a week or so out i think maybe two weeks out uh before um fight move list will come out and pdf anyway the the hard copy will be a little bit later and uh, and that has that has 400 pre-constructed special moves in it so um so there you can you can just pick uh but you know what you have a book of 400 special moves i might have just exchanged one analysis paralysis for a different one so we also put random charts in it so you could just randomly roll what moves you have which um being able being able to rent being doing a full random setup i'd be i'd be interested in just to see what sort of craziness shows up out of it agreed yeah um now Given, now, given that there's been there's been times when I've when I've discussed new editions of of projects with people, and in some cases the new edition is more of a director's cut, and in other cases it's a it's a full it's a full on rework. Um, where would you where would you where would you say that fight second edition falls into that paradigm, and what were some of the big um, takeaways from first that you tried to apply to second? Uh, yeah, it's uh, using those those terminology. I would say that second edition was designed more as a director's cut than a, it is definitely not a whole new edition. When I think whole new edition, I, I think of like you know the transition from third edition Dungeons and Dragons to fourth edition Dungeons and Dragons. That was an edition change. I yeah. mean, um, that you you weren't gonna you weren't gonna easily move your characters over from one to the other. But in fight second edition. The goal was, at the outset, before we started working in earnest, the goal was to have something that was a solid 90 to 95% backwards compatibility. 95 is really what I was looking for. Like, a few tweaks here and there, but basically, you were playing the improved version of the same game. When all was said and done, I didn't quite hit the 90-95. I think it's more 80-85%. Um... But even so, I, I did not set out to redesign the game because I didn't think the game needed redesign. I was I was quite happy with it, and it had survived. Um, it had survived ten years in an indie marketplace with consistent sales and and uh, people 
being unable to break it really so i was like this is this is solid but we did know that there were a couple of things that we wanted to address we wanted to address the clarity of how certain move elements interacted with each other and make that so that it was standardized without needing a, a really a extensive faq about all sorts of different rules interactions um, that was one big thing. And then the other big thing that I wanted to do was to make it more explicitly easy about how to do combats that had more than one-on-one -on -one fights. Like I said, explicitly so, because it was present in the first edition, but I will admit that it was not as supported as it is in the second edition. Mm -hmm. Now, give, now um, given, all, given all of that... Um, one of the, there were a couple there were a couple add-ons when it came to fight first edition that I that I found kind of interesting given given the background that you've mentioned. Now, ob obviously obviously something like something like round two is what is falls into the category of what I've nicknamed um, toy box add-ons, i.e., um, expanding on all this, putting in all the stuff that there wasn't enough room or time to put in in the core book. But Unlockables Shonen is is one is one that I find is one that I find um, interesting, um, and the big reason for the big reason for that is there is um it kind of it kind of coincides with the with the rising presence of what's been called anime fighters in the in the fighting game scene over the last few years, um, mm -hmm. especially especially with the popularity of the of um the output of say Arc System Works, um, right. When it came, when, what I'd be curious about is was was Unlockables Shonen um so, something that was presented to you or was that an idea you had in the back burner? Okay, all right. There's a lot there. Let me let me let me respond on a couple of things here. Um, first of all, I completely agree with the with the, the toy box appellation for round two. Um, I will tell you um, that I love designing tools. And, uh, and I, that's one of the reasons why Fight is, you know, the 400 pages is because there, there are so many tools there. And round two was at the time very much, there was me taking 10 years of working on this game and separating out what do I need in the core book, which was first edition, and then what was everything else. And that became round two. Um, and I, and still people will talk about like, you know, you have the core book, but you really want round two if you want to see everything else that, that can be done. That, that wasn't by design, but it is, it is the case. So anyway, yeah, I love designing with toolbox approach to things, but now Shonen, uh, first of all, Shonen was my idea. I had wanted to do it for a really long time. Um, uh, in fact, there were the elements that became Shonen were present before first edition was released. Um, but uh, in order to talk about Shonen, I, I actually have to talk about my relationship with, with anime in general because uh, you know one of my um, one of my potential sins as the designer of Fight is that I actually don't have a high appreciation for a lot of anime that is out now, um, and that's not because there's anything wrong with it. It's just that story wise, I've, I, it, it no longer appeals to me the way that it used to, but. Back in the '90s, there was more anime that was that was combat oriented. A lot of it, which was obviously fighting game oriented. Granted, a lot of it lackluster might be a generous way to to say, but but those were really influential to me. Um, in fact, a lot of the role playing elements for fight came not only from playing King of Fighters, but also watching the uh, the original three Fatal Fury uh, animes, the, uh, the, the 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 two short ones, and then the movie. Um, I, I got a lot of ideas of of characterization and story pacing and things like that um, from those. So, but I knew that there were elements of that that were not really suitable to to the fight role playing game per se, but per se. But I mean, I was also watching Dragon Ball, and I I, I like Dragon Ball. I cannot count myself amongst a Dragon Ball fanatics. That uh, Aleo is the Dragon Ball fanatic, but uh, but I, I certainly knew that that there was a lot of elements of that that then ended up in in um, Naruto and and other things. Um, um, so uh, Yu Yu Hakusho was another one that I really appreciated. Um, so I wanted to say, well, what are the elements of, of those kinds of uh, visual storytelling are different from fighting video games? 
and I wanted to develop those. And, and my favorite part of Shonen um, uh, was the, the, the system by which a fight can be won without a single punch being thrown. Uh, I thought that that was a, a, a trope that I really, really wanted to come up with a, with a way to do that, and I think it works really well. Um, it is... I've discovered that um, that players who really like shonen anime and want to play a role-playing game that lets them capture shonen anime, I, I know that fight is often heavier than what they want. And honestly, the shonen unlockable, I don't think is heavy, but it, it involves still keeping track of other things, other numbers that, that sometimes people don't like. Uh, but I really like what came out of that. No, you also mentioned Arxis. Um, and... Uh, they're they're the bane of my existence these days as a developer because trying to keep up with a with a madness that they're able to put into a fighting game is uh, is very challenging. <laughs> um, I I can I can I can certainly see that because just when you think you've caught up, they've um they end up put, they end up putting something else that that is doing something mechanically interesting, and then it's like, well, be, well. Back to the back to the drawing board, boys. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. The, the the round three book will probably be a, a pretty pretty thick toy box. <laughs> am I get Am I gonna have to, if I end up covering that in unimpressions? Am I gonna have to Am I gonna have to use the um the needle drop click up click clip up? Yeah, that's a <laughs> thick boy. <laughs> um. Now give now um given given that given that kind of in, given that kind of inter that kind of interplay um when you were de when you were develop when you were developing it um what what did you initially did you initially have the idea of you're only going to emulate um 2d style or what or or did or um did you or did you ha did you have some talks with 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 people and get talked into dev into putting a bit of a bone for the 3d end of the equation um, it was definitely designed with 2D gaming in mind, and I, I don't mind saying that. Um, but, you know, honestly, all right, so th them's fighting words, but I think 2D fighting games are better than 3D fighting games, but... Um, Look, he said it, not me. Send your pitchforks his way. <laughs> <laughs> um but and that that's not to say that i don't like them because i because because i have all of those as well but uh no it was definitely designed with 2d fighting emulation in mind and so what i did was rather than try to reinvent the wheel of of all right well now i need a separate subsystem if you want to do 3d fighting uh, i wanted to see how much there was how much commonality was there between them and let's face it there is a lot of commonality between them but i, I had to figure out all right what are the distinctive elements of 3d fighting um separate from 2d fighting and and designed for them um so i i think 3d movement on a battle grid is a big important part and i think what's in the game as attack strings uh how there's less of a focus on specific special moves and more on combinations of button presses that visually don't look so much like like a Hadouken, as they do of, you know, uh, back fist, back fist, uppercut kind of thing, um, and trying to make a system that, that captured that. I mean, when I was looking at move lists for Tekken 3, back when I was doing design, I, I, I was stymied. It was like, this move list says this character has 90 moves. That's that's crazy. And then, then you know, you start looking at it, but, but it's not 90 moves. It's, it's, it's maybe 10 moves and a whole lot of attack strings. Uh, so I, I, that's what I, I did was I tried to dive into what was distinctive about 3D fighters and tried to design those elements separately. Mm -hmm. Now, with all with all these talks of of dif of different um, different fighting different fighting mechanics, I would like to I would like to pick pick your brain a bit for a practical spin on some of these. Okay. Now. I'm not going I'm not going to be talking about emulating um specific characters um cuz I feel I feel like that I feel like that should be sa that should be saved for a poten for a potential um fo follow up um it's a, sure. it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's what I'd be fo what I'm going to be focusing on here is em is emulating um the play the play style and, cer and certain mechanics of dif of different fighters okay so I'll st I'll start I'll start with so I'll start with something a, a little bit um a little bit relatively simple and ask about the groove system 
in that was in um, Capcom versus SNK two. Okay. Uh, all right, the groove system um, works really well, and I think the groove system actually had you know essentially its origins in the Alpha series with the uh, with the isms. Um, which were, you know, basically the same. Um, so the way that the groove systems work in those video games is that you are taking the specific rules, as it were, that apply to a specific version of the video game and applying them to a, a character rather than to the game as a whole. And, um, and the way that Fight does this for a game, for a campaign, is for the, for the players, the, the director and the players, to decide what mechanics, what optional mechanics do we want to use, what version of super moves do we want to use, and so on and so forth. And they make the rules for their campaign, which are the rules for their hypothetical video game. Um, well, you could do the same thing and say that, that as a campaign, you could say, we're not going to have a set of campaign rules. We're going to have six packages of campaign rules instead, and we're going to call them grooves. And then, depending on what you wanted to do in the game, you could make it so that when you make your character, you choose a groove for that character as well. Uh, which gives you a lot more variety. Or if you wanted to do something more in line with the games you mentioned, the game you mentioned, um, it could even be that in any given fight, a character could choose a different groove. So they would be using a different set of campaign options, a different set of modifications to the core system that apply only to their character and potentially only in this fight. Uh, easy to do, fun to do. Um, I, I fooled with it in one game I did, but uh, but honestly, it's um, I'm not sure I readily recommend allowing fighters to choose their grooves every single fight. Um, I, I think unless the players were really really into it. <laughs> yeah. um, and speaking speaking of that, since sev since several of those grooves are essentially um, callbacks to uh, to other series, um, there there is there's one in, there's one in that particular group that I. That I'd like to um, I like to pick your brain on, and that is okay. the custom combo, which um, com which traces its roots to out to Alpha two and three. Yes. Okay. So the, um, the the custom combo system and Alpha two and three, and then made available as I think it was was that the Aism? Oh no, it was the um, A, v groove. Uh, A groove, right? Okay. Um, allowed the exchange of a super move instead for a time frame in which the the character had uh, had uh, after images that allowed for a great increase in the number of hits uh, for all your attacks um, so the way that that we did that and this rule by the way is one that is in um, round two I believe under the name variable combos and uh, so instead of your super energy being used to power a super move you have your super energy which gives you a certain amount a certain time count and which uh, effectively uh, you create very long combos of basic moves in there uh, so instead of your 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 super I'm not saying your special move punch your uppercut for example uh, becomes an uppercut with three basics attached to it to represent the after images that are that are attacking it um so yeah that system is already in play in round two but it was one that i thought was sufficiently distinctive as to not belong in the core rules yeah and so now the ne the next one that the next one that's a bit more of a, a bit more of a classic approach is um frame trapping okay oh. um Give me the definition you're using, just so I can so I can work with it here. Um, now, um, you, now, um, because of the fact that I needed a, a I needed a official definition, um, I have to thank I have to thank Dust Loop for 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 providing me with a with a glossary that I can fall back on. And quoth okay. that, that a frame trap is intentionally putting ga putting gaps in pressure to punish an opponent after performing an action after blocking and conditioning them to block. Um. It is it is literally trying to trying to set up tr trying to set up traps in pressure to goad somebody into doing certain actions. Right. Okay. This exists. Now, this is interesting. This is this is a, a tougher example to be sure. Um, and, and I did use. I might even have used dust loops. I did use one of the glossaries to, and, and went through and like, all right, how would I how do I get this in in, uh, in mechanics? And by the way, I didn't do that in design. I did that after the system was designed, and I went back and said, can I do these things? But having said that, 
There is a place where RPG mechanics and behind-the-scenes video game mechanics uh, eventually have to recognize that there's limits to how they can play nice together. And uh, so avoiding the RPG, having things like actually counting down, um, you know, frames, uh, <laughs> which, which I considered for a while. I considered actually going as deep as, uh, as, as measuring the frames of attacks. Um, there are some things that ultimately come down to... See how the interplay of die rolls are working here? That's yeah. what's going on there. And and I think frame traps ultimately fit in there. But but can you manipulate your opponent in a way to try to affect this more readily than just relying on a random effect of the dice? And and I think that is present in the await opening op option of combat, uh, which is a default method. Um where you can drastically increase both your initiative and control by being able to hold off your opponent. Similarly, the, the, the full defense option also does a similar thing, um, where you try to um, trick the opponent into making a bad move and, and, and uh, having themselves get exposed to a big attack, but in the game terms, that ultimately comes down to using the rules to manipulate your initiative and control to be higher. Mm -hmm. So... The next one is a next one is a bit of a is a bit of a class is a bit of a classical approach and and has been and has been so, has been somewhat of a has been somewhat of a presence since um th since day one and that is zoning. Okay, um, first of all, much of what I just said before about frame traps also would apply to zoning. Mm -hmm. But I think that there is definitely a little bit more zoning that can go on with the the range, the, the default system of combat, which is based on ranges. Um, by allowing to have a bonus to hit at certain ranges and to have a penalty to hit at certain ranges, but still being able to attack, and by this I'm referring to the plus one to hit at range zero and the, and the minus two to hit at range uh, three um, for basic attacks, that... Um, that can be used, and I have seen it used at the table to effectively create zoning opportunities where you use your movement before or after attacking to not only get the attack that you want, but to try to prevent them from getting their ideal situation. Control roles come into here as well to figure out what, what moves you can do. Um, so that's one element of zoning that, that can come into play. The other one is the... Um, uh, the jinking defensive response, which allows as a response to an opponent's attack to, to step back, potentially, hopefully, out of range of the attack, or at least to uh, to make it their, their attacks worse. And then the third way in which I think zoning comes into play is having the right combination. I'll just use a Shoto as, a, as an easy example here. I mean, the Shoto's got a ranged attack and an anti-air attack. So the idea is to provoke the opponent into using evasion to block your ranged attack attack and then using your anti-air uh, when, when they come in is a fairly classic sort of thing. So there are ways in which you do zone in the normal combat system, and I think the more you understand that in a fighting game, the more easily you can put it on the table. Yeah. Now, one, 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 particular, t one particular term that, I, that, was, that, um, that, I've, that I've, seen I've seen thrown about that I... That I um, I could I could see how this one might be a bit tricky to imp be tricky to imp be tricky to um, implement is um, okizeme. Uh, um, <laughs> g g g give me give me dust loop again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okiz okizeme, or often often sh shortened to oki. Describes a situation in which one player attacks their opponent while their opponent's character is getting up off of the ground from being knocked down. Okay. Um, all right. So um, I, I'm gonna kind of plead guilty that by by word that that was a term I did not know. Uh, you know, by by name, I certainly understand the concept. All right. Yeah. Um, so there is a couple of ways that, that this comes into play. The one way that is the most blunt, and I don't think is quite what this definition is, is aiming at, is, um, is that there is a campaign option that allows you to attack downed opponents. And, uh, and that was 
that was the way that I won all of my Virtua Fighter matches, is, you know, knock down, stomp, and, um, um, so I built that in, in that, but, but there's, the other thing is to really time, uh, get-ups, uh, to, to attack, and this is a, this was challenging, and I don't think that there's a, a rule, per se, in it that, that captures it, uh, but it is something weird for, again, non-video game players to say, well, what do you mean when, when my opponent's knocked over, I can't attack him? Well, that's because in fighting games, it's more less so now, but certainly back in the 90s, when your opponent was down on the ground, you couldn't attack them. Um, but the other thing is you couldn't stay on the ground. It was Guilty Gear that first created a character that could get knocked down and stay down. Um, and then Tekken that introduced a character that was knocked down and actually fights better from the ground or weirder from the ground with Dr. Bosconovich. Um, but, uh, so the way that you do it in fight is since you cannot attack the opponent on the ground, unless there's a campaign option that says that you do, uh, that means that you hold your action. And then when the player, the, uh, the opponent declares, I stand up because that's what they have to do. Then you use your hold action right there before they do anything else and attack them. I mean, that's... You know, that's a, not exactly the the fighting game competitive edge of doing that, but that's how it works in the game. Yeah. Um, the next one I want next one I wanted to ask on is anti is anti airs and conse and consequently it's hard it would be hard to talk about anti airs without talking about how to implement a how to implement um air combat <laughs> um in in fight. Okay. Anti-airs are easy. I mean, there's an element called anti-air. There's a defensive response called anti-air. So uh, th that, that one's right baked in there automatically, that if someone, someone is doing an aerial attack on you, then, then you can use an anti-air response to it. Um, so that one's pretty straightforward. Aerial combat, like we're seeing more and more of now, um, honestly, I haven't decided whether it needs something of its own. Um, and by that, I mean, there, there are definitely some more anime fighters now where, where, frankly, most of the combat seems to be off the ground, uh, at least at high-level play, which, by the way, is not me at all. Um, but for the most part, in terms of the fight mechanics, nothing is really happening that needs to be explicitly spelled out in the rules. So, for example, if, if, a, if a person jumps into the air, the other person leaps up to meet them in the air and, and does a, a combo in the air, which is, you know, pretty standard play. I mean, really, all that they, they have done there is that the, the opponent has moved forward, the other person has held their action, they, they, and their response to their action, they, they do an attack, and they make a big combo out of it, and to which we describe that there's this, this aerial combat. Um, whether I need more than that in the future, I guess I'd have to give some more thought to, but, uh, but that's, that's how I see it right now. Yeah. Um, now, one now, um, as some as somebody who had to endure um, D and D third edition's interpretation of this kind of thing, um, I want I want to ask a, I want to ask a bit about um, about gra about grapplers and gra and grappler builds <laughs> because obvi obviously um, this is one of those things that a lot of ge a lot of games have difficulty with. And since you're doing since fight is supposed to be emulating fighting games. It's inevitable that someone will want to do a grappler build, whether whether it be whether it's a whether it's a single character or whether whether they're trying to do a more wrestling themed campaign, because um, mm -hmm. because well, Fire Pro Wrestling World has been making waves for the last few years, <laughs> right, um, right, rightfully so. So, when so the big the big question that I, that I have is is making sure that things like throws and command throws are are can be their own thing is is that's is that something that would be feasible yeah uh, first of all yeah absolutely uh one of the um campaign options and a recommended campaign option is that every character uh, at the at power level one gets a, a, a command throw for free um and I generally play with that in my own home games uh, just because it just makes sense. Uh, but grappling builds, uh, I, I certainly think I do grappling better than 3rd edition D&D, but that's a pretty low bar. Um, but grappling builds, uh, not only do they work, but uh, I, I, I've got a couple. Um, actually, she's in the, um, the Challengers book, which is a 1st edition book, but I, there, there's a... Um, but, um, 
uh, which which was uh, Alvarez. I'm trying to remember her name, but her, her last name was Alvarez, and she was a grappling build, and um, she kicked ass <laughs> uh, because of the of the um, the way that grappling works. It, it tends it, it's very accurate, uh, which is the way that I, I emulated in the rules that a lot of games don't allow blocks against grabs. Um, so she you you can get a, a grappling character getting close, get very big accuracy bonuses, and then throws by their nature knock the opponent down, which keeps them from being able to respond right away. Um, yeah, I would say that throw-based builds can be by a, a person who understands the basics of how the rules of throws work in fight can be uh, positively brutal. <laughs> now, with now, um, one of the thing, one of the thing, one of the things that I that I had asked um, in, I had asked in the past on how, on how to do on how this would be handled is in is the vein is the vein of um of emul of emulating. Say Samurai Showdown, which, especially especially in its more re in its most recent incarnation, which is pretty damn good. Um, mm. un unlike a, unlike a lot of its competitors, Samurai Showdown is n is not as speedy. It's far more mm -hmm. deliberate with a lot more high, with a lot more high damage effects. Right. Um, how would you emulate that kind of setup in fight? Okay. Um. First of all, I like the new Samurai Showdown. Um, I'm, I'm going to take a slightly contrary opinion. I wish I liked it more. Um, I, I, I I find it not as, as engaging to me as the older ones. Um, and there was there was an aesthetic to the original Samurai Showdowns that that uh, hasn't been touched except by Last Blade. Um, that really draws me in, and uh, but that that actually leads right into your question. If you play Samurai Showdown one or two uh, from back in the day, even three and four, really, um, they're so deliberately paced compared to plays Blue, right? Like um, um, the you you have the characters move slow, the attacks have re remarkably long recovery times. So yeah, it's a it's a very different style of play. Now, as far as that element of play, you don't really have to do anything to emulate uh, if that's that's as much a, a descriptive element of the combat as anything else. But um, there are some things that are in play, both in the core rules and in round two, that were intended to to get more of Sam Show in place. First of all, regarding the the, the bigger hits, um, one of the rules, and I apologize that I can't recall if this made it to the core. I don't believe it did, but it is in round two. Is if you do a uh, a shorter um, timer for the game instead of the default timer for combat being ninety nine, if you choose a sixty or a forty five or thirty or fifteen. Um, all the attacks get more damage. And contrary to the die size thing that we discussed a while ago, these are straight bonuses. So when you have attacks that are doing, say, plus four, even plus six damage, uh, combat's gonna, gonna go a lot differently. You're not, you're not gonna weather as many attacks. So that's one way in which I've accomplished this, but also the weapon clashes... The uh, the distinctive uh, rage supers of Sam Show those are both in uh, round two as well, uh, so I, I made sure those were all in there, and then also in um, fight move list one of the things that Aleo designed was even though weapons by default in fight don't have any game effect, we created a whole list of effects that that if you're using say sword or a kusari or uh, even a bow what kind of elements should you give your moves in order to capture the kind of feel of those weapons uh so that could also be used in a sam show setting as well yeah and when when it now that br that brings me to that brings me to something that's kind that's kind of become a staple in in cer in certain franchises and that and that is specific characters getting getting a not necessarily a not necessarily a super gauge beca because that's going to be for everybody but a separate gauge for specific moves um mm -hmm. you see you see this you see this a fair bit with cer with certain characters in um in a lot of, in a lot of arc system works games 
Um, and you see this with pretty much every character in, say, um, Injustice. Okay, yeah. Um, but ba basically, basically some some sort of gauge for a for a specific move set or a specific set of moves, even or even say a mode change. Um, how would yes. that kind of thing be emulated? Okay, the um, the gauges in Injustice are, I mean, they're they're not technically in there, I because I mean I, I haven't built for Injustice yet, um, but I will. So, but. So I'm going to leave that one to, to the side. Um, as far as the different stances that, that Injustice had, and which like is standard for Mortal Kombat now, um, there is a, I think there's a way that I want to tweak that to better capture those, but multiple stances are already in the rules, where you can design characters with distinctive stances. The first multiple stance character I ever played was Gen back in, in Street Fighter Alpha. And... Um, and so there, there's definitely the idea that you can have a character who has this set of moves in this stance and this set of moves in this stance, and also including, and I have these moves in any, any stance. So that's already built in there with the multiple uh, styles rule. Um, but the other kinds of gauges is a few different ways. Um, there is a, a limited uses liability, which is not quite what you're getting at, but there's definitely a lot of uh, characters uh, who might say they have three uses of this during a battle. Uh, so that's built in there with that particular liability. The other kinds of gauges are um, uh, buff has a has a timer built into it. If you if you if you're uh, this was originally like the dragon Saul's original dragon install. Um, uh, it was a form of buff that for a certain time frame his stats would be different so you can do things that way um, and then of course you could also have moves powered by a super gauge uh, you could also design something where you have your super moves and your super gauge um, but you could give other characters another gauge uh, your EX gauge your fury gauge whatever you wanted to call it and then use the liability uses super energy and just change that to uses rage energy and uh, and and do it that way you could do that so every character has such a gauge or you could use the technique quality to make it so that only one character had such a special ability mm -hmm. no. I, I feel i'm getting pretty deep in the mechanical weeds with some of these answers but <laughs> um, this is, getting into the mechanical weeds is, so, is something that i is something that i had planned for um Okay, <laughs> and speaking of, speaking of that, um, now obvi obviously when obviously when it comes to increasing gauges th in um, in different games, there's been there's been different ways to do it. So in some cases, it's the typical um, attacking and attacking and getting hit. Um, other in other case in other cases, it's a gradual increase over time. Um, but one one particular approach that I'd be I'd be curious how um, how you'd have this work. Is is um is a command is a command based increase. Um, the the a few examples of this kind of thing is the rage setup from Sam Show or um Ga or Garo Mark of the Wolves, and also the um also the gauge setup that Order Saul has in uh, Guilty Gear. Okay, so the ability to just to make sure I'm understanding here, the ability to increase the gauge uh, without hitting and being hit. Yeah, it's just okay, that while yeah. doing it, you're going to be vulnerable since you're spending th that amount of time on it. Correct. Okay. Um, yeah, there's I mean, plenty of game. I mean, the, the um, Dragon Ball Fighters does this, and um, old King of Fighters does this as well. That's already in there. That's um, the, it, It's presumed to be a default campaign option, unless you decide to remove it, uh, called Power Up. So instead of taking your normal action in combat, you get to, um, you get to uh, roll a die to increase your super energy by a certain amount. Um, and like I said, the presumption is that that is the default because of my love of King of Fighters. Um, so that's it. It's as simple as that, really. Your love of King of Fighters, except for the bosses? Uh, you know, I, I, I even love the bosses. But here's the reason why I even love the bosses that, that I always appreciated SNK for doing uh, um, is that the thing that they would allow that after you lose, you could choose to get a bonus before you went back. And one of them being like boss's health reduced to one third that was the way that i was actually get to endings in, in s and k was to, <laughs> to be able to say all right well i'm going to nerf the boss now i can actually win but uh otherwise i don't mind them being as hard as they are it's it's fun <laughs> I, I can i can certainly <laughs> but, uh, see that except for geese because fuck him 
Yeah, yeah, he was he was rough. He was rough. Um, oh. Or any any of the art of fighting bosses or um, art of fighting art of fighting two broke me. <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a tough tough game. <laughs> um, now one one other um one other one other aspect that ended up making ended up especially ended up making a comeback because it was it was a it was a central figure in Street Fighter Four is Super Armor. How how would that how would something like that be emulated? And just for the just for the purpose of clarity, super armor is is essentially where um where an attack is an attack doesn't get interrupted by getting hit. Right. You still right. take the damage, damage, but you don't get stunned. And that's that's critical to to be able to avoid hit stun is is critical. Um, so there are there is both super armor and hyper armor um, in in round two. Uh, I I thought that they um. In fact, Super Armor may have made it made it into the core. I, I only apologize for not knowing what's in the core because it's 400 pages, um, uh, and, and I've been you know looking at it for years, so I, I don't remember what's where. But anyway, Super Armor and Hyper Armor are, are both in the game, and um, the way that normally a character would acquire this is as a technique, and uh, the technique is a uh, a quality, a feat, if you will, that a character has that allows them to take some rule or rule break that applies to them alone mm -hmm. so for example you could have a character who has the technique super armor which is a very powerful technique i have to add uh but then so you're not making it a campaign option for all characters you're making it an option available to one character or one set of characters uh but super armor does exist in the game the, the fundamental way that it works is that uh it ignores hit stun which is just huge so with that with that said, um, I know now f now um, fight second edition has been has been around for a f for a fair bit, and one thing I'm curious about is what is what you have what you have planned for the f for the future um, in term in terms of ex in terms of expansions because I think a, I think a while back I had j I had half jokingly remarked that it would in it would be inevitable that there would be some equivalent to round two in second edition. Yes. Okay. So let me tell you what is what is just just about out. What is being actually written, and what is on the the, the short wish list. So, um, as I said a while ago, fight move list, the the collection of of move special moves, will be out. Like I said, in a week or two, it's it's in layout. We're just trying to make everything pretty. Um, so that's 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 that. The two things that we are working on in the writing phase right now, um, one may not be as of particular interest to your listeners, I'm guessing, but uh, Aleo, uh, since he is from Argentina, uh, he is much more aware of the Central and South American uh, RPG scene. So we are translating the core rules into Spanish. So that uh, so that we can expand. Um, th there's a lot of fighting game fans in Central and South America as well. So uh, and a lot of really good fighting game artists. So that's that's all I'm hoping to work profitably in the future with all that. Um, and then the other thing that I'm working on writing right now is uh, is the button masher edition of the rules, um, which is not going to be a new core book. And it is not some sort of version 2.5. Like this is this is what I wanted it to be. It, it really is intended to be a supplement for people who want to get to the game faster without having to worry about the the apparent complexity of all the design elements. Uh, so what Button Masher is going to do for character creation is it's going to create archetypes, essentially mm. classes that are going to have small packages, choose two of these qualities kind of thing, uh, based on standard fighting game archetypes. I want to play the big bruiser. I want to play the fast girl, you know, things like that. Uh, and then it's going to use that along with the move list book to say, here's all your pre-constructed moves so you can sidestep the move creation. And then it's going to have a, um, a combat system, which is the core combat system with a lot of the, um, a lot of the complexity stripped out of it um, so that people do not have to feel that, wow, there's this modifier and this modifier that I have to remember to, to keep it so it's a, a much more straightforward fighting system. Um, so I'm actually really excited about the, the writing of that. I'm having a good time. I'm actually having a good time taking apart my combat system. 
uh, to say, like, if I wanted to have something that someone could sit down at a con, for example, and play more easily, uh, what would I do? And then for the people who would say, yeah, but you're stripping out all the parts that are that are really distinctive about a fighting game. Like, no, I didn't I didn't take them out. They're, they're there. That's the way the game's meant to be played. But some people are going to want a, a simpler entrance. And so that's what I, I'm working on there. So those are the things that are in process right now. Yeah. The um, the thing that's on the, the 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 wish list is definitely round three, um, and um, that's going to be a big project. So <laughs> I'm I'm a little little not sure what to do with that. Um, and then uh, and then uh, the aforementioned uh, Smash Brothers thing is is something that I I also wanna I want to make something with that. Um, we have talked about um, settings. Uh, a lot i myself am not enamored with the idea of putting out a setting book like you know here's the default fight world or something like that i think the game thrives on it being a creative uh, uh sandbox um but i have always told uh you know fans on the discord and all that if, if you want to if you want to design your setting you want to make your characters you want to make your world you want to write it up i'll i'll help you publish it that that's that's how i got it this is i had an idea for for another game and i wrote the designer and i said what do you think of these ideas he said you should write it and so so i i did he you know uh, and that was how i got into this um and that's what made me have the confidence to actually publish fights. So I'm happy to help someone else get their ideas off the ground. But I, I don't see settings being something that um, that uh, will be the case. Um, and the ex with one exception, um, I, I did a few years ago have a conversation with Level 99 Games, uh, the makers of BattleCon, and um, was going to do a licensed supplement for their characters from BattleCon um, in fight terms. Um, I'd still be interested in doing it, but I, but at the time we were working on second edition, I knew that it was going to be a big distraction, so I, I, I put it aside. I, I don't know if we're going to get back to it or not, but it's out there anyway. Well, well, with... I'll certainly be looking forward to to seeing how to seeing how the, how those projects um, develop, and it's interesting. It's funny that you bring up level ninety nine since I have a well, I've well, I haven't had the opportunity to to meet um to meet to meet Brad Ta Brad Talton Jr. I have um I have a I have a long and illustrious history when it comes to enjoying their work. Um, yes, it's good stuff. That in, that in one of my earliest reviews was um the one time that they delved into RPGs with Mystic Empyrean. Mm -hmm. um, but with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way up to the temple and enjoy the insanity at play here. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>